Now, I am not a specialist in Russian history and regrettably do not even know the language. But through a gift from my father, I became involved with the school and with the Russian branch of my family. In the 1980s, my father, Dr. Kovalev, showed me a very old album of photographs of the Imperial Educational Society of Noble Maidens, or the Smolny Institute. His mother and her sister had attended the school, and he said it had been presented to his mother for academic excellence. He gave me the album, but I did not think much about it because I was busy with a career and family. And this is the album. A little moth eaten, but it has a homemade cover, which my grandmother probably made and aqua backing. In the early 21st century, my husband and I went to Russia and tried to trace what little we knew of my ancestors' steps. We visited Gatchina, a suburb of St. Petersburg, where many of them had lived, held positions at the palace, and served in the military. And in St. Petersburg, we visited the former school. Our guide made an appointment for us to visit the Smolny State Historical and Memorial Museum. Now, since the building now also houses the government of St. Petersburg, at the entrance, we were vetted and ushered through high-level security gates. We were then trailed by two guards, probably former KGB agents, who followed our every move. The museum was very small. It has since been much enlarged. But it featured assorted photographs from the album, interesting possessions of the students, and some furniture from the early 20th century. Some rooms of the school were still recognizable, but the dining room where the girls had been served their meals was now transformed into an everyday cafeteria. I had taken copies of the album's photographs and showed them to the director of the museum. Through our interpreter, she told us that the album was extremely rare, with only a few in Russian libraries and one in California. So much of pre-revolutionary Russia had been destroyed. I began to believe that I should share the contents of the album with the public at large. There were only scattered photos on the internet, frequently with inaccurate captions and little context. I wanted to publish the entire contents of the album, 40 photographs, with a scholarly discussion of its significance. Professor Katrina Kelly, professor of Russian at the University of Oxford, referred me to Professor Alexander Liarsky, who is a senior lecturer at the St. Petersburg State University of Technology and Design. And <clears throat> he's also a Russian historian. I contracted with him to write a brief history of the Smolny Institute and a brief commentary on the photos. Both were to be scholarly and enlivened by reliance on primary sources. I'm very grateful to Academic Studies Press for taking on a bilingual project centering on photographs and publishing a Smolny album, Glimpses into Life at the Imperial Educational ah, Society of Noble Maidens. Now today, I shall first deal with the history of the school then we shall look at the photographs with commentary. And then I shall briefly outline my ancestors' journeys as much as I could find out. The Empress Catherine II, Catherine the Great, ascended the throne in 1762. A German princess, she sought to put into practice 
the ideas of the European Enlightenment in the hopes of enlightening the Russian people. She was aided in this task by one of her favorite courtiers, Ivan Betskoy, who stated in the Statute for the Education of Youth of Both Sexes, the source of all evil and good is education. The only way to achieve the latter is to introduce by means of education, a new breed, so to speak, of fathers and mothers who would be able to instill in the hearts of their children the same direct and basic rules of education that they, they, they themselves had received and that their children would in turn transmit, and et cetera, et cetera. There arose a system of new exclusive educational institutions geared to the various social strata and for both sexes, but separated, of course. It was at the Smalley Institute that girls of the nobility were to be educated. According to the charter of the Smalley, adopted in 1764, 50 five or six year old girls of proven noble origin were to be selected once every three years. Relatives had to agree that they would not demand their child back before the age of 18. The girls would be divided into four groups by age, each wearing a different color. The youngest would study scripture, all aspects of good breeding and behavior, Russian and foreign languages, arithmetic, drawing, music, dance, and needlework. For the second group, study of geography and history were added. For the third group, study of architecture, historical and edifying texts, and household management were added. And the fourth group continued the study of all these subjects, now encompassing every aspect of household management, full knowledge of scripture, and quote, all the rules of good breeding, good behavior, good manners, and politeness. Well, this outline is rather vague to say the least. And that was because the chief goal of the school at that time was not education, but cultivation. Thus, the emphasis was on religious education and the so-called secular virtues, courtesy, meekness, abstinence, generosity. This new breed of people would eventually promote enlightenment and benefit Russia. Well, the experiment raised expectations and garnered headlines. The first public appearance of the smiling ma maidens in the summer garden was a noteworthy event described in the St. Petersburg Gazette of May 20th, 1773. Today is a general promenade day in that garden. However, the presence there of the smallly maiden seems to have attracted more than the usual number of strollers and caused many to travel there. Upon learning of their arrival, many of the distinguished nobility gathered and there was a great crush of people. The maidens were accompanied by a huge number of people who crowded after them blocked the whole street and almost completely stopped traffic. During the promenade, anyone could see in them a becoming audacity. Everyone liked their noble unself-consciousness. Many of the people began to talk with them about various things and they expressed themselves to everyone and about everything freely, unconstrainedly, with particular pleasantness and answered all the questions of those curious about their ideas and knowledge to their satisfaction, end quote. Catherine may have had a hand in this account. <clears throat> the students' lives were rigidly organized. They got up early at a time prescribed by the uh, charter and took great care in their appearance neatness and cleanliness. 
lessons were from seven to 11 in the morning, two to four in the afternoon. The other time in the day was for reading, prayers, walks, meals, and play. Games and fun were encouraged. And the Smalley students loved to put on theatrical pr productions, which the Empress also encouraged and which became fashionable entertainment in St. Petersburg. But in order to build up the child's constitution, the students had very cold bedrooms and meager diets. With all the changes in the school's curriculum in the following decades, the cold bedrooms and the sparse food remained constant. Now, Catherine the Great was enthusiastic about her projects at first, but began to have doubts about her idealistic educational ideas, especially after an inspection of the Institute revealed serious problems. For instance, the student's command of foreign languages was very poor, yet history, physics, and other subjects were taught in French, which the girls didn't really understand. Well, Catherine turned her attention to other things and the Institute suffered somewhat. After her death, it came under the care of Emperor Paul's wife, Empress Maria Fyodorovna, who had as her aim, the cultivation of the ideal mother. The Empress eliminated the youngest age group this way, students entered Smalley at eight or nine, time enough to have established good health and strong family ties. And she was a master micromanager. She personally prepared the schedule of classes, personally selected the plaster cast models to be used for drawing, this was probably to avoid any improper revelations. Personally formulated the instructional programs and personally edited the text on household management. Registrar, teacher, censor. She disrupted wedding plans that she deemed unsuitable and she did not allow those born out of wedlock to attend the Institute. She said, quote, I do not want the pupils of the Institute to entertain even the thought of any birth or kinship other than the norm. Most important, in line with her concern for household management, in 1808, she arranged the move from the buildings of the Voskresensky Smolny Convent to a new building nearby. This had sufficient space and would be the home of the Smalley until the revolution. Maria Fyodorovna founded or was in charge of an entire network of new female institutes, educational and charitable institutions. The reformed Smalley was the model for them. Admission rules were standardized an entrance exam was instituted. The Empress approved every admission to the Smalley. Many of these girls were poor but deserving members of the nobility. They were now subsidized by the imperial rulers. There were improvements in organization, curriculum, and the quality of the faculty. Another charitable facet was the establishment of the Pepinierki. This is from French for Pepiniere, for a nursery or cultivated seedling. If a student showed real academic mastery, she could remain three more years for additional pedagogical instruction. Then, if she had to earn a living, she might find a post as a governess or teacher. This was the beginning of female pedagogical instruction. After the death of Maria, the imperial family had less 
close supervision of this mommy. In 1845, the entire system of female education was standardized and placed under the control of departments and committees. The Smalley Institute was deemed the highest establishment of its time. Highest because its pupils were all members of the nobility by birth and because its programs of study were considered the most complete. But the imperial family continued to play a part in the life of the Smalley. They continued to visit the Institute and even continued to attend final exams, which must have been an added source of stress to the students. And the students often visited the Tsar's royal palaces and parks. The Smalley remained a symbol of class divisions and aristocratic exclusivity. Further reforms were instituted. Enrollment was every year rather than at three-year intervals. All classes were taught only in Russian, and there were reforms of reforms haggling over the emphasis given to aesthetics and cultivation on the one hand and learning math and sciences on the other. Academic arguments always take much time and energy. Suffice it to say that the education given at the Smalley was excellent for its time and purpose. And we are fortunate to have photographic evidence of the lives led there. Now, many of the Russian schools produced albums in connection with a graduating class or with an anniversary celebration. But this collection of 40 photographs I'm about to show you is the only one produced at, of the Smalley that is currently known to us. Professor Liarski presents a convincing case that the album was compiled in 1904 to 1905 for an institute celebration at the highest level. Recognition of 25 years of service of the headmistress of the Institute, Princess Elena Lehren, which coincided with the Empress's own service to the department which encompassed all imperial educational institutions. We do not know to whom the album was distributed, if it was reprinted, if some or all of the class of 1905 received it, or if it also served as an academic prize to selected students. I only know what my father told me very late in life and his mother or aunt had told him. Photo number one, which is up on your screen, is of the Smalley Institute building. As I mentioned before, the Smalley Institute was originally housed in the buildings of the Voskresensky Novodevichy Convent. This was founded on the site of the Smalley Palace of Empress Elizaveta Petrovna. Smola is tar or pitch in Russian. The palace was named this because of the pitch stored there in the time of Peter the Great. It was stored there for the building and maintenance of ships. The name Smolny came to be applied to both the convent and the institute, and the students were called Smolyanki. The new building of 1808 was actually constructed as a refuge for widows, a charitable institution. But the Empress decided she would like to use it for the Institute. So that is what was done. Autocracy has its advantages. The architect was Giacomo Corengi, and he considered the building to be one of his finest creations. Photo two is the church. Um, this is not the Smalley Cathedral. 
It is just a little church built on the site of one of the old convent's classrooms. Here, they held burial services for teachers and students, marriage services. Here, the priests heard confessions and gave communion. Now, priests were among the few men admitted into the Smolny, and thus were subjected to crushes and the boarding school habit of, quote, adoration. The Smolny girls wore perfume and smeared their lips with it when they were to exchange the three ritual kisses with the priest at Easter. One student fell in love with the deacon, marrying him when she graduated, and he was defrocked. Photo three shows the student's report to the headmistress. Every day, two girls from each class had to function as monitors for 24 hours. They had to maintain order, give instructions to the servants, and report anything amiss. As they were also being trained in household management, they had to be present when the headmistress talked with the household manager about groceries, their quality and price. They also had to deliver and bring back the laundry and check that the bedrooms and dining hall were in good order. Photo four shows the council room. The Council of the Educational Society was the governing body. Initially, it was solely made up of high-ranking figures, such as the nobleman Betskoy. By the time of the album's compilation, there were also members of the Institute's administration. This august body made crucial decisions on household matters of the school, teachers' salaries, which were low, and the students' academic progress. Photo five shows the reception of relatives. Visiting day was important. Joyous reunions for many and sadness of students whom no one came to see. These students are lined up against the back wall. You can see that if you zoom in. Um, <clears throat> At the beginning of the 20th century, on Thursday and Sunday, there were visiting hours from 12 to 2. The relative could speak with the students under the close supervision of the class ladies. Here is an account of such a meeting around 1905 written by a man visiting his cousins. Quote, Throughout the room, round tables had been set up for the visitors. The Institute girls were led in from the interior chambers by class ladies under whose vigilant eye they sat down with their guests. The visits were carried out in a dignified, even ceremonious manner. They talked softly. No expansive demonstrations of family feelings were allowed. The visiting days were the happiest days in the measured and regulated flow of the Institute's everyday routine. The girls had had time to feel homesick. Now they heard the latest family news and felt some of the spirit of home. The visitors pulled out the presents they had brought with them, candy, fruit, and various trinkets which had been ordered during the previous visit. And of course, during this time, another note was handed over uh, with a list of requests for the next visiting day. Photo six shows the pedagogical staff. This picture shows the class ladies and their supervisors. They were responsible for all the disciplinary and educational work of the school, but did not do the actual teaching. They were given a minimal salary, 
yet many stayed on for decades as they had no alternative. They treated the girls in a variety of ways, from threats, scoldings, and even occasional beatings, to caring attention and loving attention, and a loving affection, I mean. Number seven shows the teaching personnel. These were the people who instructed the girls in all subjects, scripture, history, foreign languages, biology, physics, zoology, music, dance, and needlework. The teachers were professional, but they too were not well paid. Uh, they frequently had jobs at other institutions as well. Music exam, photo eight. <clears throat> this is a rather sobering scene, undoubtedly frightening for the student. Look at all these examiners. Instruction in music was extremely good at the Smalley. And Franz Liszt, the virtuoso pianist, and Heinrich Ernst, the virtuoso violinist, were invited to play there. I do not believe Liszt accepted the invitation. I don't know about Ernst. Photo nine shows the hot class. Some students went on to have good careers as professional musicians. One of these was the Russian harpist Ksenia Erdely. She started studying the harp at the Smalley and continued playing and teaching, remaining in Russia after the revolution. Now, harp study had a long tradition at the Smalley. Dmitry Levitsky painted Glafira Alimova playing the harp. She was in the first graduating class of the Smalley. Photo 11 shows a concert. Now visits of the imperial family, anniversaries, final exams, all were celebrated by a concert. Sometimes these were public concerts and relatives could come. Evidently, they pulled out all the stops. According to one account, quote, then the music began. Two pupils played solos on the piano. And after that, the opera, The Barber of Seville, was performed on 16 pianos, two seated at each piano, including me. Some of the students sang. I double checked this account of 16 pianos. It is correct. Um, photo number 12 shows the parlor of a senior teacher training class. Now, this is a photo of a Pepinierki class in the teacher training division. They were the best students who had enrolled in this program. For various reasons, they had no future without income from teaching or serving as a governess. When the students completed the curriculum, they received a diploma from the Ministry of Education and were then granted the right to teach privately. Note, um, if you zoom in, the collection of Eastern fans on the wall to the right. There was at this time great interest in China and Japan during the Russo-Japanese War. <clears throat> Number 13 is dancing class, the minuet. Now dancing was an integral part of the education of a noble woman. By studying this, she could be more graceful and have self-control. One pupil reminisced about their final exams. We stood up in long rows and began the minuet and gavotte, smoothly and gracefully, curtsying, joining hands, executing a glissade, which created a very graceful moving picture. Now, this picture 
in the album was later published in Capital and Country Estate in 1914. If we could have photo 14, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I include it here because ostensibly it is taken of the graduating class of 1905 and it lists the names of the students in the first row and underneath the picture. My grandmother definitely graduated that year, but I cannot identify her in the other rows. Photo 15, class one of the Neva section, a geography lesson. All the classes were divided into two sections. The Neva section faced the river Neva, and the city section faced the streets of the city. Each section had its own classroom, and the teachers came to the classrooms, except for courses that required special equipment. Now, note this woman in the back. A class lady is ensuring that all the students behave and be attentive. There she is near the back and her desk is near the front in the bottom right. During the course of the lecture, she would take notes on their behavior, which might be reported to the headmistress. These notes also went into the final grades of the students. One such note taken in the Russian language class read, not satisfied with the behavior of the class, especially with Molchina, who was preoccupied and didn't answer any of the questions asked by the teacher for which she received a grade of one. Photo 16, as class one of the city section, a history lesson. Note the heater in the back of the room. These classrooms were very cold in the winter, probably especially on the neighbors. Uh, and the bedrooms were as well. But that was in accordance with the 18th century belief that this would strengthen the child's constitution. The history taught naturally favored the monarchical type of government. According to an 1852 manual for the education of the pupils of female educational institutions, quote, in order to educate Russian maidens, it is necessary to show them how God himself has protected Russia from enemies both foreign and domestic by means of two heaven sent foundations that serve as the cornerstones of its existence, Orthodox Christianity and autocracy. Photo 17, class two of the neighbor section and needlework lesson. Needlework was part of the aesthetic side of education and was considered very important. The students learned embroidery, sewing, how to cut out and assemble a garment, and frequently made gifts for their relatives. Photo number 18 shows a physics lesson. According to the girls' accounts, physics was not one of their favorite subjects, but the equipment was quite up to date. A projection screen, an exhaust fan, and instruments, which were then quite modern. Don't they have beautiful braids? Photo 19 shows a gymnastics lesson. Gymnastics was introduced in the early 19th century and followed a special program drawn up for female institutes. Running, jumping rope, climbing stairs, walking along a horizontal post, holding a weight in their hands, and swinging on a trapeze, to name a few skills. 
Photo 20 shows class six, that's a younger class, before a stroll. Note that there are no decorations and pictures in the lockers. And look at the girl leaning to the wall at the right. Um, if we could zoom in on her. Although all the others have braids, her hair is extremely short. Now that would ordinarily not be allowed for hairstyles were strictly enforced. They symbolized order and good breeding, but she had probably been ill and the cutting of hair was often part of the treatment. Ice was applied to the head to lower the temperature. Photo 21 shows the dining room. This was a place for eating and also for education. The charter of the school stressed neatness and eating, proper deportment, and a, quote, pleasant courtesy in their conversation, end quote. So food fights were definitely out of the question. But the students were constantly hungry and the, and the portions quite meager. Photo 22, the washroom. This is very Spartan, just the essentials. But cleanliness and neatness were to be maintained at all times. Photo number 23 is the dormitory. This is a description of the dorm from 1860s. The decoration of the dormitory was extremely simple. In the middle stood two rows of iron beds with soft mattresses and one pillow. The white flannel blankets had been washed many times and had become very thin. During winter nights, everyone shivered from the cold because the blankets did not keep us warm. And for some reason, they did not let us have our own. By every bed, there was a white wooden table with drawers and a bunch. We put our box under the table. In the table drawers, we stored the following. In the top drawer, toiletry articles, such as combs, brushes, soap, a towel, and in the lowered spare shoes. The drawers were opened every morning when the beds were made and a class lady walked around the dormitory to check that everything was in order. This is certainly not like the plush living quarters of today's boarding students and a bit of a shock for a noble girl coming from a well-equipped home. Photo 24 shows therapeutic gymnastics. The introduction of therapeutic gymnastics was quite progressive. Begun in 1840, by 1868, there was a chief supervisor of this specialty. He prescribed special exercises according to the size and condition of the student. Quote, every sick pupil should participate daily and for not less than half an hour a day. But the pride of the Institute was its medical facilities. Facilities unique among the secondary educational institutions of Russia. The care given to the health of the students resulted in a death rate well below the national average. And this photo is of the outpatient reception. Every day, the class ladies and maids did a survey of students to detect any problems or illnesses early in their um, progression. <laughs> photo 26, shows the infirmary. The food was better in the infirmary, so it was an attractive spot to miss classes, 
and be well fed. Perhaps it also encouraged some hypochondria. Photo 27 shows a corridor in the infirmary, huge place. Photo number 28 shows a contagious ward. Cholera and other serious illnesses were treated here and other pupils were forbidden to have any contact with the sick. The next three photos have to do with the students' outdoor activities, all necessary for their health and well-being. Um, this is subtitled Garden, and it shows a little promenade taking place, very proper. There's about three groups of students circling around the, the uh, garden. Um, the next photo is subtitled Hills. This has tobogganing, and they tobogganed in their um, rather bulky clothing. And photo 31, which could be a Christmas card, uh, shows a skating rink. Nobody has even fallen. Photo number 32 shows the council office. This photo serves as a dividing point in the album, mirrored in its composition. At the left are the uniformed men who made all the decisions of the, for the noble students. And they had been pictured previously. And at the right, are the women who helped to run this establishment with many maid servants, cooks, and groundspeople. Their pictures are to follow. I'll just give you a selection of them. Photo 33 is the tailoring room. Thirty-four is the linen room. And 35 is the kitchen. Now, during the academic year 1904 to 1905, there were 191 servants for 442 students. Impressive ratio. These people were to be as in inconspicuous as possible. And think of this. In this sheltered world where students could not even socialize freely with their relatives, in 1903, more than 90 male servants lived full time at the Institute. They were not paid any attention and were not considered a source of danger. And I don't believe there was a case where they presented a threat to the students. Photo number 36, the bath. Now this is an important topic and is the last photo in this album. Even the charter of the school stated that there had to be a bath. The students had to bathe under the care of a doctor if they were weak from illness. In the 1860s, the bath left much to be desired. Quote, it was located in the basement. It consisted of two very small rooms, scarcely able to accommodate 30 people at a time. Against all the rules of hygiene, the pupils were rarely taken to the bath. They were required to visit it before Christmas and prior to fasting at the Great Lent. During that time, two stoves heated it almost continuously. The pupils were taken there by sections, which were about 30 people, while class ladies could bathe alone for one hour each. Apparently at this time, according to another Russian historian, 
pupils visited the bath once every two weeks, and in addition, washed their feet once a week in the evening before going to bed. However, in 1898, a new model bath was installed, and it is this which is shown in photo 36. There was also a greater interest in hygiene. These sheltered girls of the Smolny were very well educated for their time. In the words of one graduate in an unpublished memoir, on the whole, Education at the Institute develops good sense and provides one with well-known skills, life skills. It trains us to avoid extremes, to make good use of our time, to take some care with trifles, with external discipline, with speech thought out ahead of time, with the settling of debts, with everything that can serve a person in her struggle with life's trials and tribulations. There were to be many trials and tribulations in the 20th century. If we could have uh, photo one again. After the outbreak of World War I, life at the small need changed. The students helped some in the war effort. Balls and holidays were canceled. The daughters of deceased military men were suddenly without support and were thus um, <clears throat> thrust upon the imperial rulers for help. And teachers also struggled in the wartime economy. In 1917, the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies moved into the Smolny Institute. The students relocated to Novocherkask or to other countries. The symbol of Imperial Russia, this example of aristocratic privilege became the center of the revolution. Many reminiscences collected later contrast the cleanliness of the old Smolny with the dirt brought in by the workers and soldiers. Quote, hundreds and thousands of jackets and gray overcoats, greasy and reeking of smoke, made their way down the corridors, hurrying somewhere, bumping and running into each other. It was dirty, soiled with spittle, smelled of strong tobacco, boots and wet overcoats. In the corridors, you could feel the beating of the pulse of revolutionary Smolny. Down the corridors in thick gray streams flow patrols, squads, pickets. The electric bulbs under the vaulted ceiling grew dull from the stuffy heat, the hot steam of human bodies. As the site of new power, the Smolny embodied all its functions. Here there were new ministries, co consisting sometimes of one person, a couch, and a nameplate. There on the third floor, in one of the rooms used for washing, a jail was set up. The maidens had gone, the old order was no more, but the small leaf was still a site of power. The Bolsheviks took over in October, and in the Smalley Museum, there are exhibits of Lenin's study and living quarters. When he moved his headquarters to Moscow, it has the local communist bureaucrats. And in 1991, it came to house the party and administrative leadership of St. Petersburg. The governor's offices are located in the Smalley hence the tight security. And Vladimir Putin began his political career at the Smolny. To this day, the Smolny has always been a site of power to be admired, emulated, or even feared. Now, 
My great grandfather, Leopold Antonovich Imshenik Konvertovich, was a military man who was promoted to the rank of Major General upon his retirement. He died two years later in 1896, leaving, leaving his widow Natalia the sole support of a family of eight. Natalia petitioned the Smalley to accept her two younger daughters as boarders at the government's expense. Such charitable measures were not uncommon and the petition was granted. Olga passed the entrance exam and entered in 1898 with full tuition, room, and board. Her sister Maria also did so and entered in 1899. And photo 37 shows Maria and Olga in 1900. Photo 38 shows Olga two years later. Photo 39 shows Maria and Olga in about 1905. They look like twins, but take my word for it, one of them is older. And photo 40 shows Maria in her senior uniform, the coveted white in about 1906. After graduation, Olga married Mikhail Ivanovich Kovalev and had a son, Mikhail, who later became known as Michael Oleg Kovalev. Photo 41 shows the lovers by a tree. Note their initials carved into the bark. You can sort of see O and M. <clears throat> My paternal grandfather, Colonel Kovalev, was a ballistics expert. He was in the armaments business, buying supplies for the Russian army. When World War I broke out, he was sent to the US to purchase some guns. There were many German submarines patrolling the usual routes, and they did not wish to lose the gold which they had bought to pay for the munitions. So the Russians took a submarine, perhaps supplied by the allies, around the north of Iceland, along Greenland, up the St. Lawrence into Canada, and then they went to the US. The photo 42 shows Mikhail Ivanovich Kovalev in 1914, before or after this submarine trip in 1915, the colonel traveled to the U.S. accompanied by Olga and their son on the vessel Kursk. For a time, the Kovalevs lived in New Haven. Coincidentally, on the same street where I later lived as a graduate student. Colonel Kovalev served Russia as senior inspector of rifles produced by Winchester Company in um, New Haven and of machine guns produced by Colt in Hartford. In 1917, he was appointed representative of the Russian Supply Committee in America at the Imperial Munitions Board in Ottawa, Canada. Now, sometime after the Tsar abdicated in March 1917, Colonel Kovalev wired Alexander Kerensky asking instructions. Kerensky replied that he should continue his task as Russia was going to remain in the war. When the October Revolution took place, Colonel Kovalev again wired asking instructions, this time of the Bolshevik government in the Smolny. Same question, different answer. He was told to send the remaining gold back, wrap up the business and return home. 
How the gold was shipped and its route are mysteries. But the societal unrest and bloodshed in Russia was enough to convince the Kovalevs to remain in the US. And I'm very glad they did. They moved to New York City where their son Michael grew up. He attended Columbia University and then its College of Physicians and Surgeons, marrying my mother, Barbara Pointer, after graduating. And photo 43 shows my parents on their honeymoon. Following the military tradition of many of his forebears, Dr. Kovalev served in the US Army as a medical officer during World War II. There he is in his army uniform. When he returned, he established a thriving medical practice. And here he is in his office. Now, many of his patients were Russian emigres who shared a common past with my father. Alexander Kerensky had also emigrated to the US spending time in California and eventually settling in New York City. For the last years of his life, Kerensky chose my father as his doctor. This man, a key figure in the Russian revolution that brought down the Tsar and also the Smolny Institute, the man from whom my grandfather had requested instructions on how to proceed. This man was in my father's care until his death in 1970. Dr. Kovalev always saw him outside of his regular office hours because many of his emigre patients regarded Kerensky as a traitor. One can only imagine the history they discussed and the reversals of both, of fortune, of both families that they experienced. My father was a man of few words and did not discuss his parents and all that they had endured. And I scarcely knew my paternal grandparents, except for very occasional stiff visits for tea rather akin to visiting hours at the Smolny. I so wish I could question them about their fascinating past. I would recommend to everyone to ask their older relatives about their past, to interview them, to record them as they reminisce. They will most likely enjoy reliving their experiences and you will have preserved some of your family history. Thank you.